Hey, welcome to Whitefields Community Church Sermon Extra. It's great to see you again this week. I'm here with Pastor Nick Cady, who is the pastor of Whitefields Community Church here in Longmont, Colorado. And we are drawing to the close of our series called Faith in Motion, a study in the book of James. And this week we're in chapter 4, the end of chapter 4, into chapter 5, and uh, chapter 5, verse 12, actually. And... Uh, a lot of great things that we, we looked at this week and a lot of great discussion that happened in the community groups and uh, a couple of great questions and that they really wanted to talk about. And of course, you weren't able to allude to this particular question uh, that much on Sunday morning because, you know, it's a it's a sermon in itself, but it's God's will. How do I discern God's will? It's kind of a question that, that every Christian wants to know. What what does God want for my life? How do I know? How do I find out what God's will is for my life? And so you want to share for a few thoughts on that particular question. Yeah. So, it you know, that's what James says in, in verse 13 of chapter 4, he's like, hey, you know, you people who say, I'm going to go to this place, do this for a year, make some money, and so on. Um, and then he says, hey, wait, you don't even know what tomorrow holds. You know, what is your life? That's the big question he asks. And um, and then he goes on and he says in verse 15, instead, what you should do is this. You should say, if the Lord wills, then I will do this or that. And what he's saying is not that all you have to do is tack on this phrase almost like superstitiously to everything you say. What he's saying is that before you make your plans, you, you run your life through the filter of this question, what is God's will for my life? So that's the big issue. And, and yeah, people want to know, how do I know what God's will is for my life? Um, and it's not just like in general, right? Because I think that uh, in general, most people, most people know how to discern God's what we might call general will. But I, it's, it's more like specifically like, should I take this job or should I take that job? Should I marry this person or not marry that person, right? Should I move here or not move there? And those are big life-shaping questions. I think the, the best way to approach this is to understand that fact, that there is what we might call the revealed will of God. Like I can think of about four or five verses in the New Testament that say this phrase, this is the will of God for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is the will of God for you, your sanctification, right? So we can be sure that those things are God's will for us. It's the revealed will of God. That's what we have here in the scriptures. They tell us God's character, the things that God loves, the things that God hates, the things that God prescribes for us. And, um, and those are things that we can know, right? And so you might call, the other ones have been sometimes called God's uh, hidden will, God's secret will, or maybe God's personal will, right? These are the issues like, what does God want for me personally, where there's no like Bible verse telling me, you know, move to this town or don't move to that town. And, um, and that's the bigger issue. Here's my basic approach to this. If you're living according to God's revealed will, I think that when God wants to reveal something to you, it's not going to be like uh, where you have to twist his arm to get him to tell you. I think that if he wants you to know something, he will make it very clear to you. Now, there are some instances, for example, where we see something like that. Like in the book of Acts, we see it several times where it says that the Holy Spirit led Philip from this place he was at in Samaria, where there were great things happening. He was doing, you know, ministry work, lots of people becoming Christians. And then the Spirit tells him, I want you to go out to the desert south of Jerusalem to an isolated place where there's nobody at. Now, that seems very counterintuitive, but the Spirit led him there. He follows the leading of the Spirit, meets this Ethiopian eunuch, leads him to the Lord. And tradition would say that that eunuch then took Christianity to Ethiopia. And, um, and then the Spirit leads him away from there. And so, like, for example, we see in the life of the Apostle Paul, where he wanted to go into the region of Asia, which was the uh, area around Ephesus, and that the Spirit, it said, forbade him from going there, right? And, uh, and two times he wanted to go there, and God said no. And yet Paul said, okay. So he ends up going other places. Great things happen. Eventually he does make it to Ephesus. We see Paul saying things like, hey, here's my plan. I'm going to go visit you in Rome. Then I'm going to go to Spain. And then we see that those plans don't work out. But he says even in those places, if the Lord wills, then this is what I'm going to do. And so it's this idea that we um, want to walk in the revealed will of God 100%. And then when God wants to reveal his will to us, I believe that he will make it clear. Like, um, I think that's the thing to understand about the character of God. 
is that he's not trying to withhold stuff from us that would be useful to us, right? If he wants you to know something or do something, uh, he's going to make that clear. On the other hand, there might be two options, and you might say, well, both those options, neither of them are sin. They both align with godly principles, biblical principles. I can see how both of them could be good. And then I think there are times when God says, all right, I'll let you decide. You know, I think that that's, uh, and that's really kind of an honor and a privilege. It's him treating us, uh, you know, and I think about it with my kids, right? Like I treat them as adults, or I train them to be adults, I train them for maturity by letting them make choices for themselves and deal with the fallout from those choices. Um, I remember dealing with some people in the past, uh, specifically in Hungary when I pastored there, they really struggled with this issue of knowing God's will to the point of like being like immobilized, like paralyzed. They wouldn't make any decisions because they were so afraid of doing something that wasn't God's will, even in minor issues. And the way I kind of describe it to them in this way is like, hey, look, it's kind of like if you had a kid and the kid was, you know, you, you tell him, wake up, it's time to go to school. And then you're in the other room getting ready and uh, your kid's, you know, yelling from their room. Hey, so should I get out of bed? Well, well, yes, we, we got to get out of bed in order to go to school, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, oh, hey, hey, should I get dressed? Well, yes, you should probably get dressed. That seems like a good thing to do when you go to school. Hey, well, well, what color pants should I wear? And it's like, well... I'll let you decide. I just want you to wear pants, right? Like, I think that, that in a lot of cases, when God doesn't specifically say something to us, revealed by his spirit, which I believe he does, like he's given us his spirit to lead us and guide us and direct us. But when he doesn't, and there's a choice in front of us, I think there are times when he um, gives us the opportunity to make a decision for ourselves. Yeah, definitely. And I think the overarching you know, would you say principle with all our decision making is is the gospel? You know, that kind of you know began with Jesus's exhortation to us to preach the gospel, to to make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father and you know the Son and Holy Spirit, and and you know that leads people you know in your decision making. I think if you can always keep the gospel, you know that can those which way should I go, A or B? Well. What's the what's the gospel tell me to do? You know, which way does it lead me? I think a lot of people have that in ministry, when they are they're wondering, hey, which way should I go? Well, if I go here and preach the gospel, or there or preach the gospel. Well, you know, that was kind of Paul's overarching. Yeah. You know, he wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to go to Spain. What was his desire to yeah. to eat Spanish food? No, yeah. it was the gospel. You know, to that was you know, and if he was. You know, he just went somewhere else. The Spirit forbade him here. Well, he went over here and he did something else. And the gospel is what, what, what drew him, drew him out. And uh, yeah, I think it's well. So on that term too, as well, it's it's interesting to think about that. So Paul says, you know, hey, I want to go to Spain, but you know what? Then he ends up not being able to go to Spain. At least some traditions say he went there. Maybe he did. We don't know. But the fact is that if he never goes to Spain, God's still able to do His work mm -hmm. through somebody else. And I think that. There's some degree in that of saying, like, I trust in God's providence, but I also trust in God's plan that I, I mean, I say this, um, don't take this the wrong way, I guess, but maybe we're less important than we think we are, right? Like, yeah. like, okay, so, you know, what if I was supposed to go there and then I, I messed up and I went the wrong way and now those people over there are never going to hear about Jesus? Well, I think that God... Uh, can make that happen still, right? Like, yeah. So yeah. Like, well, I mean, I guess that's the yeah. idea that God gets to be a part of my plans yeah. or do I get to be a part of right. God's plans? Right, right, right. You know, and uh, I think that, yeah, that's definitely one of those questions I think every Christian really struggles with is what is God's plan for my life? And I think it's just getting, get to know your Savior, get yeah. to know the, the you, heart of God. And you have told me your view on this. So maybe you could just share it with others. Like the whole thing about walking with God, and as you're walking with God. Well, I mean, that's kind of how I've done my, that's how I've, in my own personal life, it's like get get as close with God as I can, you know, because he, you know, as they say, you you spend your mountain, you you know, you, you spend time with the Lord on that mountaintop face to face, you get to know with him, you get to know him. But, you know, our lives are lived down in those valleys. And, you know, many times in my life, I've, any way down that mountain, I felt as God's will for my life because I just spent that time with him and, and I don't feel like you know that he's going to lead me in a wrong way I really have 
kind of tried to let that relationship with the Lord be the source of my decision making. As much time as I can spend with Him, know His heart, read His read His Word, understand the revealed Word. Then can you know it can really help me make decisions in that you know as you said kind of the hidden will of god those things i'm not quite sure about i think a lot about god's revealed will his revealed character to us can identify you know those personal decisions you know which direction i i need to go you know and so i kind of really let that drive my relationship with the lord and when i'm not in fellowship with the lord that's the times when i feel i don't know what should i do should i you know, and then I try and get back to the Lord. I don't try and find necessarily find His will. I try and find His heart, and I think that's kind of been the thing that's kind of driven me over the years. And I've made some big decisions in my life. You know, going from a Christian home, Christian church, Christian everything into the Marine Corps. <laughs> you know, kind of out of you know completely you know covered in this umbrella of God. You know, into into the Marine Corps, and then I went from the Marine Corps to a foreign country where I didn't. Speak you know, speak the language with this, with no support and a backpack and my guitar because I just felt, you know, the Lord. Because I'd spent the six months before that time with the Lord, and I just felt like whatever I went, that's what he wanted me to do, you know. And so, yeah, I don't necessarily look for his will. I look for his heart. And that kind of drives my, my – has driven my decision-making over the – over the years, you know, and you know, I think some people might go at it from a different perspective. Um, but I think that's been something that's really worked for me over the years. So one of the other questions, though, that was kind of a hot topic at the um, community groups was the uh, sin of omission. You know, in verse 17, it says there, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And as also you do, we weren't able to really dive into that on Sunday morning, but it was something that was really discussed and a part of the community discussion. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I always think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer in this case. You know, he was a Lutheran pastor during World War II. And what was happening in Germany was that a uh, couple things. One was that there was a whole part of the church which was completely compromised and totally on board with the Nazi program. But there was another part of the church who just said, hey, look, um, we're just not going to get involved, right? The government is doing their thing, but we're going to just do our thing and kind of like not say anything against the government because if we do, then we might lose the, you know, we might lose our status legally. We might, um, you know, have our voice diminished or something like that. So in order to still be able to function as a church, we're just not going to speak out against uh, the evils of this regime. And uh, Bonhoeffer took a very different approach, right? Like he, um, he formed a new movement, uh, the Believing Church, and their whole thing is started a seminary and they were persecuted. I mean, he, ultimately he ends up, ends up being killed. But what he said is this, to... Um, to not speak in the face of evil is to speak. To not act is to act. And he said to remain silent in the face of evil is itself evil. And it, it's exactly what uh, this verse is describing, is that when there's something wrong, to not do something about it, if you know the right thing to do, is a sin. And I mean, that, that goes from very small areas of our lives, right, where we you know, maybe just passively ignore something, rather than doing the right thing. But it can also go into huge, you know, social issues that we face today. So. Yeah. No, it's definitely something. And and sometimes we don't know what to do necessarily. Oh, yeah. like we, we're faced with the abortion issue. We're faced with immigrants coming across our southern borders. And not only the United States, but globally, we're yeah. facing issues with, you know, communism or the North Korea or genocide in, in Africa and all of these things. And it's very, you know, it's sometimes we feel helpless at that yeah. level, you know. What do you think some of the things we could do as just Christians, you know, in our churches, you know, what for what the maybe some of the first steps we could do in, in maybe engaging with some of these issues? Yeah, I think first is be informed about these issues. I think, um, you know, like there's a lot of false information out there or misleading information that's, I think, um, highly charged because of whether it's politics or whatever, emotions, fears, that's a huge one. I mean, I think here's the thing. A lot of the pushback against helping people worldwide or helping people locally is fueled by fear. But as Christians, we, are, we have the 
resources to make us the least fearful people in the world. We literally, because of the hope of eternal life, like we talked about this Sunday, we have no reason to be afraid. And, and we have every reason to not be afraid and to view this life, right? If your life's a mist and you know that it's going to be here for two seconds in the big picture of time and then eternity, well, then you know what? I can take some risks for the sake of someone else because there are some things that I can only do in this life. Right. One of those is alleviating suffering and, of course, preaching the gospel and receiving the gospel, right? But if, um, if there are things that I can only do in this life and this life is short and I know that my eternity is secure, then I can be the bravest, most courageous person in the world. I can take those risks in order to do those things that I can only do in this life. So number one, get informed and, um, and make sure that you're not getting misinformation that's fueled by fear. And then find out, I would say, find out about people who are already working in those areas because there are great organizations. And guess what? If there's not, maybe that's a great opportunity for you to do something significant. And if there are, then, hey, get on board because there are some great people doing some great things, especially in the name of Jesus. Yeah, no, we at the Christian church, we're the ones who should be making a difference and not leaving it to to the to others. But uh, definitely, definitely something, just one of those verses you really think on and let God deal in your own heart and spirit with it. So I'm glad there's a lot of stuff we discussed today, a lot of, you know, two two very big questions that Christians, you know, for, for centuries have struggled with and will continue if God, God so desires and does not return today we will continue to to uh, struggle with these questions but yeah let let the, the heart of God drive you and and, and let uh, you know let the gospel be that which through which you you view uh, those things that God's called you to do and so we're so glad you were with us today whitefieldschurch.com in case you missed the message uh, on YouTube there ring the bell no, notification you'll hear from us uh, every time there's new content of we're up on Facebook of course Instagram SoundCloud we're everywhere on the internet you'll find us there it was great being with you this week God bless you